that immense healing and it just I want to say it was like being in awe but that doesn't even come close to describing the feeling it was just amazing it was beautiful it was safe it was home Good evening and welcome to the show, Earth to the Other Side. I'm your host, John Glasspool, and tonight I am speaking with Zaya, who is a former full-time caregiver and now works part-time with uh, DSHS, where she deals specifically with aging and adult care. And she's had two NDEs, one as a young child, the other uh, about 17 years ago. In addition to that, what I find very, very interesting is, uh, and I hope we'll talk about, is her pre birth memories. So on that note, hello, welcome to the show. Great to have you. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for inviting me. My pleasure. So let's start from the beginning. Um, my mom was just frantic. My temperature had gone up to 106 and they actually thought that they lost me at one point. Um, I was only four years old and I had an experience that took me to my mother's mother's mother, my great grandmother, who actually passed away before I had been born. I remember feeling the most amazing love and delight. And I recognized her, I knew who she was how I knew I hadn't seen her as, you know, being alive, but she, she asked me how things were and she had given me a message that now it's been so many years. I don't remember the exact message, but she gave me a message. She said, I want you to tell your grandma that I said this message and it had something to do with I remember at the time, my grandmother was really worried about something that was happening in the family. And what triggered the memory was I was visiting her house and I saw a picture of my great grandmother and my great grandpa. And I remember saying, I remember sitting on her lap. <laughs> and she said, Oh, you do, huh? I said, yeah, she told me to tell you that you don't need to worry because blah, blah, blah. I can't remember even the exact words now. I wish I would have wrote it down. I was too little to really think of that kind of stuff. And I remember my grandmother coming out of the kitchen and looking at me. And she said, huh, well, that certainly sounds like something my mother would say to me. <laughs> but honey, there's no way you could know that. She passed away before you died. And I told her, I said, but it happened when I was four when I died. And I don't even know how to describe the look on her face because she knew I was really sick. I was constantly sick up until the age of five. And she just came and hugged me and she had these tears in, my, in her eyes. And the next words that came out of her mouth were, honey, I believe that you visited my mom when you died and you came back to tell me. And she, he and I always had a special relationship after that wow that begins years already you're not supposed to be doing that <laughs> it was a very moving experience for me because after I told told her about that that's when I told her about what I ended up calling my elevator dream and that's the pre-birth that's when I told her that I remember before I was born. And um, we had a really neat moment. 
because I told her, I said, everything was white and there was light everywhere and all the people were white light. And I was afraid that I wasn't going to come back. But they said, it's okay, you'll be okay. And I remember going into what felt like an elevator and the doors closed. And it was dark, but sometimes I could see light come through the walls, but it was really, really still dark. And I could hear the people out there talking. <laughs> I thought they were the people that I had just left behind. And uh, I remember the sensation of it getting smaller and getting really tight and then I remember the sensation of suddenly it going up and that's why I called it my elevator dream but my grandmother and her wonderfully excited voice <laughs> <laughs> said, honey, I believe that you are remembering what happened just before you came into your physical body. Because I believe that we existed before we came here and we will continue to exist after we leave these bodies. And as a young child, that is a pivotal moment in how your thinking patterns develop, how you view yourself, how you view the world, how you view everyone else around you. Mm -hmm. And uh, knowing at such a young age that we are just mortal beings here, but who we are inside these bodies. These are just vessels. Who we are inside is who we are. Um, we, each of us have a beautiful intellect and, and soul that has been developing far longer than we've been existing in these physical vessels. We came here with talent and thoughts and ideas and preferences and we are inhabiting these physical bodies that are um, I guess you could say vulnerable to certain things because of our natural programming and and a part of the quest in this existence is to learn to overcome those uh, impulses to learn to drive our damn car <laughs> Because it is, it's it's our vehicle. It's what we use to move about this earth, and and to tame the the physical being and and take it into a part of our total being. I believe that's what we're here to do. It's the innocence of mm -hmm. our our existence before. Yeah, um, yeah. I I've even asked sometimes why would I agree to come here. <laughs> There had to be something really good in the air. Because <laughs> I remember it so clearly. And I'm like, why did I agree to leave that? <laughs> Especially if I was so afraid that I wasn't going to make it back. We know we're going to return to that beautiful place, right? So. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, it, and, and it's still beautiful. Um, you know, I... Like I told you before, I I don't consider what happened 17 years a, a near-death experience because I was actually dead. I was not breathing. I had no heartbeat. I was dead. Mm -hmm. There's a difference. They couldn't get to me right away because my car was so mangled and smashed. Um, even the state trooper is the I don't know how you're still alive. I think 
the one that happened 17 years ago was most significant for me because I've grown, I've had many experiences, I've I've changed a lot since I was a child. I don't have that same easy faith and belief as I did as a child. You know, as children, things are very absolute. We take it for face value, right? And, um, you know, that level of trust, once it has been tainted, it's, it's really hard to get that kind of faith back. That's why this is so significant to me because ever since this has happened, I've had some continued interesting <laughs> things that have followed me, like almost like having some kind of a guardian angel army with me or something because something had to have happened because the area that I was sitting in the vehicle that from that point forward was completely intact it was everything else from behind i took the full 70 mile per hour impact in my back it hit so hard that it actually broke the seat belt um uh so hard that my right hand broke the gear shift my face hit the steering wheel so hard that it bent the steering wheel back towards the back i mean that it's unreal that I should even be alive. I don't have pictures anymore of what I looked like after immediately following the accident. Um, that computer ended up having a corrupt uh, hard drive. So I, I lost everything. Um, but uh, I was in the hospital for about a week. And a lot of people, when I told them what happened, that I remember being dead. And they said, oh no, you were just on a lot of drugs in the hospital for that week. It's just, it's just the drugs talking. You know, trying to be critical thinking and not get too caught up in, in religion and, you know, what people believe. I wanted to believe that what I experienced was just some hallucination or a dream but the vivid memory of it and talking to some other people who also had died actually died not just got near death um we we have we have common memories of what occurred um some people because they're they're so deeply involved in their religion um can sometimes translate what they experience to uh, something that they can grasp a little bit easier with with our mortal confines okay um but it's a construct you know the the this this thinking it, it's it's construct that we have um become used to um when you leave your body that construct is gone <laughs> um so we either have to accept what we are experiencing or we can translate it into something that we can comprehend and translate to other people so that they know that we remember something what i experienced wasn't earthly there there's there's no way to even equate it to something earthly um i like i said i, I in i want to say i was floating but i wasn't floating i was stable all i had to do was think and i was there um if I had a question of what I was seeing, the answer immediately came to me. I was aware that there was another being with me. This being was just off to my left side. 
And wherever I went, that being was with me. I want to say it was a male energy. I felt a male energy. Um, I felt this incredible safety, love, compassion. The most significant thing that defines this experience is the moment I became aware that I was existing outside of my body. The only thought in my mind was a single thought. There was no more noise. I, I describe it as noise. We, we, we get this noise that goes on in our head because we have um, our daily tasks, things that we did wrong or things that we didn't do. We've got, you know, our, our conscious guilting us. We have memories or old tapes from childhood that are always playing. Things trigger those things. Um, <clears throat> maybe traumatic experiences that we've had that we've kind of stuck behind. You know, things happen that trigger that. That's noise. We always have noise going on in our head. Um, even when we're thinking, we think we're thinking pretty clearly. That's nothing compared to the clarity of thought, the single-minded thought. The focus was more intense than anything that I've ever experienced in this body. There was no more worry. There was no stress. There was no concern about anything that I left behind. There was this absolute tranquility and peacefulness. And... I want to say it was like pure logic, but it wasn't just that because I could feel love. I could experience that joy. You have to be able to feel something to experience that. So it's not pure logic. It's just all the good stuff without all the bad crap. It didn't follow for a while. I don't even know how long it was. It, because it seemed like forever that I was just kind of floating there and looking at everything around because I was in the midst of our solar system. I could, I could feel, I could turn and see the sun. I could see the moon. I could see other planets in the distance. I could, I could see, I knew that the earth was behind me. And I knew that what I was looking out at was space. But then what I saw was this ribbon of densely packed lights. And they were all twinkling in different colors, but they were bright lights. It wasn't planets. It wasn't a solar system or a asteroid belt or anything. I looked at that and I said, huh, what's that? And immediately the answer came into my mind. They're just like you. And that's that aha moment. I know what I am now. <laughs> I am my spirit. This is me. This is the purity of me. Without the physical form, this is who I am, who I was before I took that physical form. And the joy that came from it was immense. And uh, all I could do was just take in that immense feeling. And it just, I want to say it was like being in awe, but that doesn't even come close to describing the feeling. It was just amazing. It was beautiful. It was safe. It was home. And uh, I'm not afraid of what comes after this life anymore. I I don't question it. So what happened it next? 
I became aware that somebody was doing something to my body. I could feel, I, I heard it was like in the distance. It was like at the end of a very, very long tunnel. I could hear somebody yelling. I remember first looking over or turning my attention to this other being that was with me. And it wasn't, like I said, there was no talking. I, I was like, what's that? And he was like, do you want to see? And I remember turning my attention to the sound. And then it got louder. And all of a sudden, it felt like I was being sucked down into a funnel. Um, that's the best I can describe it. Like I was just, <laughs> um, and it was like everything around me just folded in and, um, uh, there was, I think at the moment where I was back in my body, it was like an explosion of light in my brain. Um, I remember gasping for air and there was it was just all blood there was face you know my my face was covered in it and um the nurse that revived me happened to be in the car that stopped to see if anyone needed help she happened to be a nurse at the hospital that was just around the corner that i ended up being taken to um I got to talk to her after I was released from the hospital. And uh, she said, you know, when we got there, it looked like somebody had already got out of the car. I just checked the car just to be sure. And she said, you were strewn across the console. Your legs were pinned and there was blood everywhere. And, um, She said you weren't breathing. I couldn't get to you to do CPR. I said, how did you revive me then? She said, all I could do was reach the bottom of your pant leg through underneath the seat. I could get the door open just enough to reach my arm underneath the seat to grab your pant leg because your, your legs were underneath the seat. She said, I just started yanking on your pant leg at the same rate that I would have done CPR. It's the only thing I could think of doing. And I was like, oh, well, obviously that was enough. She said, sometimes just jerking the body is enough to get somebody breathing again, especially if they haven't been uh, not breathing for very long. Um. But like I said, it looked like everything from my body forward was perfectly intact. Um, you saw that picture of that mm. vehicle, right? Oh, yeah. Even the state trooper said, the forensics said it was, it was very odd that the car stopped crunching at that point. Um, that usually they, they see, you know, person be crushed between the seat and, and the dashboard, especially at that high of a speed and no brakes being used. It, it, it really felt like there, there was possibly some otherworldly force that was stopping that impact from taking my life all the way. I think definitely. I mean, when it's not your time, it's not your time. Right. Apparently. Yeah. I get these images in my head sometimes and it feels like it's real, but I've said things to other people and they've thought I was just some strange Yahoo trying to peddle my snake oil. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that person that was with me was the same person that was with me when I left and first came to this world. 
it was somebody, it was a familiar person. It was somebody that I knew, somebody that knew me very. This is the male very, energy you were talking about, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Do you think that yeah. was your spirit guide? Or a guardian angel? I I think I think both of those are really good words that a lot of people have used for this person. I think we all have one. And maybe some of us have more than one. <laughs> <laughs> you know, some of us are a little haphazard. But <laughs> I think um I think this companion, this 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 being is there is more than just a guardian angel. They have this person has the ability to affect change in this very real world that they they can cross this being crosses those lines that we can't cross right now. What things he communicated to me, some of that was very private. Um, and I don't want to seem selfish in that way, but I think there are some messages that are meant for us alone. This being has a great significance to all of us. But we are all connected. We are all brothers and sisters. Not a single one of us, no matter how alone we might feel sometimes, none of us are alone, ever. I think uh, part of the compensation for coming back to this hell hall was I, give, I was given some extra gifts that are um, have proven to be very perceptive and um, have proven to allow me to help other people in ways that I could not have if I had not been able to see the things that I can see. Speaking of other gifts, that's um, interesting. Um, I, did you, do you feel like you came back with any other um, gifts after your NDE? Um, I remembered some things from my childhood that I had buried. Uh, things that had amounted to some some deeply buried re resentments that I needed to address and heal for myself. Um, I believe I was given an insight and an extra strength to deal with what I was going to have to deal with in the aftermath of healing from all of those physical injuries because trust me before that I was a wimp okay <laughs> I was a wimp um my ability to handle pain definitely shifted <laughs> after that Zaya if you can tell um our audience yeah you know those that are you know fearing death which is pretty much most people what would you tell them I'll tell you what I told my friend Angia when she died last year from cancer because she was very afraid. She didn't know for sure. And as as a caregiver, you know that's one of the hardest things to see in in a in a client, a patient. And you know that that there is no turning back. Death is the end result of what they're experiencing. And the fear is very real. There is no pain. There is absolutely no pain, physically or emotionally. Whatever pain you are experiencing in this life, whether it's resolved or not before you pass away, you will no longer experience the pain. You will still have the memory of it, but the pain of it, this thing, is gone. It's something that you know eventually is going to happen, and you're just worried about it or being afraid. It's nothing to fear. It's nothing to worry about. Because everything is okay. 
once you get there, there's there's no worry. There's no pain. There's no fear. There's no strife. It's just peaceful clarity. So take care of today. Take care of what's going wrong in your life. Don't be afraid to be the first one to say you're sorry. And do whatever it takes. Make sure that your family and your friends know how much, how deeply you love them. Because that's the legacy that you will leave behind. That's how you will be remembered. That's what matters here. Do you remember what it was like when you went slamming back through that funnel into your body? That feeling? Yeah, I do. Um, <laughs> as a child, the first time that you put that vacuum cleaner hose on your face and it sucks your cheek and you go, oh, crap! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it felt like that. And then the moment where you finally get it to release, that was like the explosion of light in my brain. It, I felt it in my brain before I felt it in my body. Zaya, I want to thank you so much for agreeing to do this and for sharing your experiences. Thank you so very much for doing it. Thank you for, for the opportunity. I hope this, I hope this brings peace and um, reassurance, not just to people who are looking at death right now, but to their loved ones who are worried because this message is more for them than anyone.